think the reason why there has been such a divide is because the finance world is so aggressive, um, very cutthroat, and it aligns a lot with a man's way of thinking. The reality is fintech is not that sexy. It is hard work, but it is super fun and fulfilling. Why? Because most of us are in a vulnerable financial position and suffer from money stress. So our job as fintechers is to come up with solutions. Welcome to Fintech Product, the place to be for career advice for women in fintech. I am Moni Millares and I've built a career building digital banks from scratch, both in the UK and Southeast Asia. I strongly believe in togetherness and I'm here to open up, share and bring fintech product and leadership experts together so that you don't have to start from scratch to thrive in your career in fintech. I'm Mexican British living in Asia and I'm recognized as Singapore 65 fintech product leaders and women in fintech. Hello everyone and welcome back to another episode of fintech product podcast. Woo! So today, of course, we have an amazing product woman in fintech. Yay! Yay! And we've got, yay! <laughs> uh, and, and we've got Amna Hussein. Amna and I, we actually, we've met before. We used to work together when I was in Tandem Bank and we were in that process of building the bank, but she was working in Pfizer at the time. So it was kind of a partner fintech relationship and now we're both in fintech and what I love about her profile a she's an amazing leader but then b she's got experience in non-product roles in product roles and not only within financial services so she's been in a range of industries so she's worked for Teradata, Pfizer, Read Exhibitions, VT and now Nomo so Amna it's a pleasure to have you in the show welcome. Oh I'm truly humbled by the introduction thank you very much Moni and I'm so excited to be here today. Oh thank you me too I'm thrilled to have you here. So I'll start with one of the most common questions that I get during mentoring, and you've lived through that. So the most common question I get is, hey, how do I move into product? I may or may not work in financial services, but I want to get into product. It's kind of sexy and cool, and I want to get into product. How do I do that? You used to work in project management before. So can you tell us a bit about your story and how did the transition happen? Absolutely. So I'll try and start from the beginning. Um, I was very much interested in project management. As you mentioned, it's where I started my career. So um, I was doing a sandwich course at university, which means you take a year out to go into industry before you come back and do your final year. And I, of course, I did it in uh, I did it as a junior project manager for Teradata. Um, very, very interesting. Loved it. I knew this is what I want to do after after university. Um, and I, I went into project management afterwards. And um, it was good. Uh, and I was looking for roles at the time as well. And I remember I, I was in touch with a, with a recruiter. And this is before, I guess, the product boom. Mm. and um, I kept going for like these typical kind of junior project manager roles and she's like there's a there's a product role you know maybe you should just try it go for it and I was like ah <laughs> um, and she was like no no really I, I think you should go for it and I did and you know she asked me for my feedback and I was like I, I'm not too sure if, if I'm the person they're looking for I got the phone call on the same day saying when can you start and that was oh, cool. the start for me as um, within my, my product career. And since then, you know, the rest is history. I've, I've made a career out of it. Um, and I would say I get this question a lot as well from people who reach out to me, um, mentors, uh, mentees, sorry. Yeah. Um, and it's, it's a very interesting one because a lot of the people that I know, and I'm sure it's the same for you, we got into product by accident. Um, and it, it, it was it was not planned. You know, most of my colleagues are like, yeah, we were doing something else before. And, you know, we got asked to do this. And it, it, it but now I feel like it's a very conscious decision. Yes. That yes. people are making. Um, so I, I think the key thing 
which made my transition from project management into product quite easy is you've got to recognize the skills that you're using. It's very, very similar. So, and, and that's what I love about both areas, but more about product management is the skills are just so transferable. Yes. Um, I, you know, you mentioned that I've gone through different industries and that purely is because as a, as a product person, it's the skills that you carry with you that's really exciting because you can actually take them anywhere so what I say to people when they ask me that is don't necessarily look at the job description look at the skills that it's asking you to have and that you yeah. will grow on because they will be 100% transferable um, and you'll be able to take them pretty much anywhere you go because as, as a product person you are someone who's communicating you're prioritizing um, and you need to do those things effectively right so I say look at the skills and because they're transferable it gives you that freedom to look at roles that really really interest you look at industries that really interest you so you know if I'm talking to someone specifically if they're if they're younger I'll say you know look at what excites you find yes. whether it's a company whether it's a role look at what looks interesting to you and go for it because if you do something that's interesting you will excel in it, first of all. You're going to really enjoy building on those skills. Um, and it's just overall going to be a very enjoyable experience. So that would be my advice to anyone saying, you know, how do I get into product is look at the skills that it's asking for, build on them, do whatever you need to. to, to if you do feel you need to grow in a certain area, you know, go on courses, whatever it might be. Um, and look at something that, that seems enjoyable for you because it's not going to be the same as your friends or your other exactly. colleagues. Exactly. Yes, I totally agree. It's about, yes, enjoying what you do. And then even if you don't at some point, like find the joy, right? Like yeah. it's all in the mind. So it's yeah. like, if you stay curious, you can enjoy even the most boring tasks. So it's like, enjoy exactly your, enjoy your work and try to to work in a, in a company that you and basically company and product that you enjoy building at the same time yeah and that can change over time right like you can start off exactly. doing a certain job a certain industry and you might find you know what I think I need a change. I think I'm, I need a change like I'm done here I want to try something else that is absolutely fine like I said transferable skills you can take them anywhere exactly and, and I, I love that because that it's kind of like giving us a little bit of a glimpse of your leadership style, you know? So when we were reconnecting the other day, I loved how you talked <laughs> about your core values and how you protect your team. And I was like, this is the type of leadership that we need to see more of, like in the industry worldwide and in podcasts, you know, like that it's like, showcase that it's like hey guys this type of leadership does exist and it does exist within the industry especially within a male dominated industry so can you expand on your leadership philosophy oh, that's very kind of you first of all um so for me i as i've um as i've gone through the roles that i have um First of all, you have to recognize that you are a leader in some shape or form. Um, I think, you know, associating leadership with just your CEOs or your senior leadership team right. is, it, 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 obviously they are, you know, your leaders, but leadership is so much more than that and it's so much wider than that. And I came to a point where I realized, actually, I've been a leader for the last maybe five years or so, because as a, as a product owner, product manager, you are leading a team and that you team are. is made of people. Um, and that is sometimes the hardest thing to achieve when you're working um, in a professional environment. So I, you know, having that realization, it, it brings about the responsibility that you have to those people as well. Now, my typical leadership style is very much um, servant leadership. Yes, I fully believe and I, I write about this all the time. I post about it all the time. You are there to serve your people as much as they are here to serve you and when you think of particularly your product team yes they'll have their own line managers sometimes some of them may um, they may align into you um, but at the end of the day they are looking to you for guidance yes what work there is um, the day-to-day -day challenges that you might have because in a lot of particularly product teams you won't have like a, a scrum master you've got to wear a lot True. of hats 
True. Um, so you have to be there for your team. So yeah, it, it was that realization that I had that really brought about that responsibility and made me think about, okay, how do I ensure that my team is happy as well as us making the product a good thing as well? Um, so for me, my team absolutely come first. Um, I, and my team know this, like I will defend them <laughs> <laughs> to the end it. of time. Like, um, because you see them day in, day out working hard. You know, not no one comes into work wanting to do a bad job or anything. And I think it's so important for you as a leader to really try and inspire them, but also be there for them. They have to know that you are there for them. If they mess up, you're there That's for them. Fine. If exactly, they're doing a good yeah. job, exactly. If you, if they're doing a good job, call it out. Like you have to have to be there for them and just feel like they are supported so for me it is about serving them um, making sure they're all okay having one-on-one -on -one conversations with them um, and ensuring that they're, they're getting the best out of the role as well um, I've talked to a lot of people out of their role <laughs> because I want the best for them even though I've had to take the hit and you know it means yeah. that they leave my team honestly I'm like as long as you are getting what you need and you're happy I I prefer that um, so, yeah, I, I, I love it. And, you know, coming into a team and knowing that they are happy and they feel supported and they're just happy with you. Right. I, I think that that's very important yeah. that as a leader, they need to be happy with you. And if they're not, you need to reflect, OK, what's going on and keeping that communication yes. channel open. Yes. Um, but also one thing that I really want to reflect on is inclusiveness as a leader mm. so yeah. you've got to make sure like diversity and inclusion is a huge thing right but what does that actually mean you know what does it mean when you're going out with as a team and you're going somewhere where someone can't drink someone can't eat yes. the food with the restaurant you're going to someone can't really partake in the activities that you want to do you've got to make sure that everyone is included uh, and try your best at it and I feel the world that we live in today as leaders you should be really conscious of your team you know understand them as people do they have a family do they have other commitments you know do they need to go and do the school run of course how do you accommodate you know time zones is a huge thing right how many of us work with a team that are just scattered around the world I, I I think it's been years since I've had a team that's just been under one roof um so we have to be conscious of people just have lives outside of work and that's fine that is okay um I do not expect any of my team members to act as if they don't have a family they don't have other things to look after um so really just trying to understand it and accommodate it and what you find then is when you're making um when you're accommodating for these things people are so much more engaged they want to come in they want to do their best exactly. because they know look we've got someone behind you supporting us you know why wouldn't they so for me it's all about serving leadership yes and, and and you raise a very good point because if I reflect on my journey the times where I enjoy the work the most and the times where I dislike the work the most is when the team competition when I love the team that I'm working with, I'm having so much fun. And yes, we have deadlines, this and the other. But like you say, like we've got each other's back and we laugh during the day and it's hard and something mess up, but like we still laugh, right? Yeah. Those, it's, it's very different when you go to work happy because you're working with, with a team that A, you don't have fear that they are going to scream at you if you mess up. It's more of a, hey, well it's part of the process how do we fix it <laughs> and and like yeah it's like that interaction is very fulfilling I think and it does impact the quality of your work definitely if you have it it puts you in high performance and the opposite when you don't have it and you're in a toxic or semi-toxic environment it does impact your your ability to perform well in, on the negative side and it impacts mental health and like body, yeah. like it impacts everything. So it's super important. Absolutely. Either way, it's a direct correlation. Um, exactly. And it, that's not nice because as much as we like to say, you know, once we log off, that's it. It's, the it's, mind. No, the, exactly. The mind. the mind doesn't switch. You do think about these things. Why? Because we're professionals. We care about what we do. And like I said, everyone comes to work wanting to do a good job. Um so absolutely it does impact us and you know being being in a toxic environment 
it's going to have a negative impact whether you like it or not um and even if you're a strong person as well you know and, and, and this is a point I want to put out that you could be the strongest person ever um but if you're in an environment that is just not nice it is going to impact you yes yes I think we all agree on that and it's important to say it right because yes. people who have gone for that experience know it but people that maybe encountered that experience for the very very first time they may think oh no it's something wrong with me I'm not tough enough it's like no you are tough enough and there's nothing wrong with you it's just that it's a difficult environment therefore yeah. it will impact you because yes. we're humans <laughs> yes we take that. things personally a lot yeah. I think and you know we say okay maybe I could have done better here I could have done better but the truth is you're doing the best you can and a lot of the times the stuff that's happening at work just isn't right it, it's not right it shouldn't be happening and unfortunately you're there to deal with it um so you do need to take a moment to yourself and you know and I've done this many times take a step back and think is it really me or is it just something else at hand that I can't control and it's just something I need to deal with deal with the yeah. best I can exactly yeah. exactly exactly so a beautiful scenario that it's like that could basically test your your servant leadership and being nice with a team is in fintech we tend to work with very unreasonable deadlines how do you maintain your cool <laughs> with the team <laughs> when it's unreasonable <laughs> deadlines and you're still having that style so that's kind of one part how did you do that and then the other one is from a more practical perspective how did you manage those unreasonable deadlines yeah it's a very good question so I think when it comes to the team it's it has to be open communication like I try and be as open as I can and say look you know this is the deadline that's coming let me give you the context let me help you understand why this is such a yes. big deal and often when we do that and you know we talk about why this is a big deal we'll turn around and say well actually maybe it's not such a priority as that person's thinking or no okay I get it like this really is important you have to build that understanding with your team and they've got to understand why you are being asked to do something in a certain time frame because they're going to want to aid you through it right yeah um because you need you need your team you can't do it alone um so I, otherwise if they don't understand it what you then get is um just not not a good vibe and they're gonna almost not rebel but because they yeah. have that lack of understanding they're, they're like well I don't want to yeah, do it you know exactly. it's do like you know it's what not, I mean yes it's kind it, of that it's, vibe it's not, of like it's not that urgent exactly but even with like you know explaining something nicely to them even that doesn't cut it sometimes because your team aren't stupid they know that actually this shouldn't be a priority and that's what I'm saying you know you have to have that open communication with them so you both both parties understand yeah this is a requirement this needs to be done now and if not then it's your job to to go back and say well actually I've spoken to the team and we we think, we think this can not. maybe hold off for a little bit Exactly. Yes. Because I think even senior leadership, they have to understand that they have hired or have had a, had a hand in hiring experts. They are there for a reason. This is exactly why. Um, so you've got to take our word for it. And I'm more than happy to give back, you know, stats, figures and say, look, this is why. And, and you should absolutely be doing that as as, um, as a team leader or whatever you might be. Um, but you've got to be able to communicate that back and forth um, because it's only fair. Um Practically, how how I've made that work within the team is, you know, like I mentioned, having that open communication, but that pushback, it's very important. So I'm always communicating to the team, look, guys, if anyone's asking you to do work, you've got to make sure you've got all the information that you need. And also we're, get, we're giving back the information also. Um, so, yeah, I think it just comes down to very, very open communication throughout the levels um, yes. in fintechs you'll know especially startups you may be dealing directly with your SLT with your CEOs um, so it becomes even more important to have that open communication throughout as well um, and yeah it, it's being able to say no but why but exactly what, yes. why are we saying no yeah cool I love that because yes as a product person you need to learn to 
negotiate. Like it is like the when to push back, when not to push back, when you receive pushback from the team, when to accept it and when to push back again. And then to be like, hey, leadership team, like push back, push back. <laughs> it's like, yeah, it's in the backlog. It's in the backlog. <laughs> it's like, it will get there. Yeah. And also, said. yeah. And you have to also understand why your team are, are trying to push back as well. Again, it comes back to having communication with the team and it may be something quite small. They may actually need some extra time. They may actually need some help. To, yes. you know, they may be saying no because they're nervous because they think, oh, I've got to do this part on my own and figure it out and, you know, give it back to Amna so she can go report. So the easier yes. thing to do is just say, look, no, 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 just put it in the backlog. Exactly. So you need to understand what their needs are. What what can they do to achieve the goal that we've set out as well? And yes. again, it's your job to try and enable them the best that you can. Um, so understand why your team is saying no is very important. Yes, and I guess it sums up to that because then you said you at the beginning you said communicate, then I said negotiate. But actually, what you do when you're like communicating, negotiating, it is you are understanding. Basically, yes. you're understanding why the company needs those timelines and what needs to get done to get that timeline or not, and the priorities and understanding the person in front of you. Like you said, like coming back to servant leadership, it may be that hey that week the i don't know like the child is sick the whole weekend usually they good work until very late but you know like that yeah. week is not feasible and then yeah. it's about understanding the whole context so that then as a team you can make the the kind of like the best decision for the team of course you as a product lead you have to take the accountability but it's not a dictatorship it's a hey taking into account everyone Absolutely. And I often think of myself as a, as a product manager, you like our human bridge, you know, that business is very like, you know, very corporate, you know, we need this, it's, it's very um, arbitrary, right? Um, and then you come to your team, which is like the complete opposite, you know, they're like, there's a lot of emotion there. So you've got to be that human bridge of, okay, I understand that. I understand that. Okay, how to be, how to be me in the middle? And how to be all understand? Yeah, yeah. exactly. The other question that I get a lot is, uh, and, and this has been like a specific question that I get, that it's like, oh, product in fintech is not like product in the books. <laughs> that I found when I got that when I got that message, I was like, that is spot on. <laughs> <laughs> so, what is your experience in as a product manager in fintech versus other industries or other type of, let's say, financial services company? <laughs> So is this is a very good question because when I when I finished up at BT and you know my ex colleagues would ask me oh how's it going you know you're at that new fintech the one question that I said to everyone for like the first six months is it's just so different it's so different <laughs> <laughs> they're like what do you mean I'm like I I just I, I can't know. explain I can it it's just so different you know <laughs> and um. So there's a couple of things, right? It's it's so heavily reliant on regulations. Like yes. that is one of the um one of the first things you probably have to be aware of. You don't have to know every single regulation because obviously, you know, I'm I'm pretty new into fintech. I, I don't have financial services knowledge as anyone who's an expert in the field would, but you've got to be aware of it. So I remember when I, I did come in and I said to my line manager at the time, I said, look, um, I want to add value because this is a new industry for me. Um, you know, how, how will I do that? Um, and she goes, actually, you know, there's someone you can talk to. So I got put in touch with someone who had spent their career within um, financial services, lovely lady. And um, she became my mentor uh, for a little bit. So I, I asked, you know, tell me basically wow. what I need to, to, to add value as best as I can, but stay you know, within the rules and everything. And she was like, look, regulation is your best friend. You've got to be aware of them and know how it's going to impact your product. Everything else will follow, but that is one thing you've got to be aware of. So I would say within FinTech, that is very, very important because, you know, we're all aware of the FCA, regulations, all of that stuff, you know, one, one little trip up and that could mean, 
huge fine for exactly if you're not complying with something that is that that's one of the biggest things uh, that you definitely have to be aware of um and i think it's it's generally a very very competitive world um if you look at how far fintech has come in the last even two three years right like yeah, our, our contactless yeah. limit in the uk has it went from oh god i think it was like 30 pounds before now yes, it, it, you know it went up because you know we didn't want any contact with people during covid um so many things that have spurred changes but it, it's just so so different i mean i always say to people like before digital banking was a thing and fintechs were growing we would do about 90 percent of our banking in a branch now it literally is the other side, other way around like right it phone. is yeah and look how quickly all of that happens so i think one of the biggest differences is just you really really have to be aware of what's going on around you it's and i know that's the case for a lot of products but i think fintech is something that it now impacts so many more people you know it, it really is a global thing you know everyone does digital banking now nearly everyone you know people's grandparents now do digital banking because they've been forced to do it so I I, exactly right um well we may do it on their behalf or whatever but because it impacts so many people now you just have to be so aware of what's going on um like for me for example when I started working for um uh for Nomo I didn't realize how many people were actually aware of Sharia banking it's it it's it's an upcoming it thing, thing. And, and yes. it's a thing right and and people are aware of it because I had messages from people saying oh you know what what's your proposition because you know we know about Sharia banking we're actually interested in it whatever and these were like non-Muslims reaching out to me as well at the time Interesting. um so it's yeah you just have to be aware of of things around you a lot more because it is such a huge beast that's growing it is uh, very, in these very parts bit. of the world. Let's say Malaysia, like Southeast Asia. There is a lot of it's it's a large Muslim community, so yeah, it is growing. It is growing. Islamic banking is growing and has potential. I, I noticed that like you you told this story about your manager introducing you to another lady, basically, and then she became your mentor. What I think that's like for me, mentorship is super important. And at the same time, it's like men, women, like it doesn't matter, like if if your mentor is a man or a woman, but at the same time, I think it's important for us as women to, to give a voice to the challenges that other women may be having in the industry, A, and then B, for all the girls that are just finishing uni or, you know, they've been, they've had a few years in their career and they are about to enter the industry because it's cool and sexy and, you know, you know, everybody wants to go in. I think people need to go in with their eyes wide open as we change the industry for the better. So in yeah. your opinion, what are the challenges that we as women have in fintech that you need to be like, hey, that may happen. That's a tough oh, question. That's a very tough question. If it's a tough question, but I, I love talking about this. Um, and so I'm going to talk about it in fintech terms, but also generally as well. So with fintech specifically, I think it is definitely an area we need to focus on because it's been male dominated for forever, right? Um, and I think it's only now that we are starting to see women come into the industry and kind of I guess balancing out a little bit Um, now there are two different challenges I feel there is obviously that being up against your male counterparts how do we do that and it's not a competition but how do we how are we seen I guess and that ties into my second point which is the challenges within oneself yes that's what I was about to say yes yeah because it, it all ties in and I think the reason why there has been such a divide is because the finance world is so aggressive, um, very cutthroat, and it aligns a lot with a man's way of thinking, I suppose, in their psychology. Mm-hmm. And as women, because I've, I've done, I've done a bit of research into this because I this was part of my own self-development so I'm huge in self-development yeah. and I really wanted to understand okay what what it is that I can do to 
help myself yes. and I I think once you start to chip away at this it doesn't really matter which industry you go to um but sometimes the challenges are a lot more in your face like fintech you know being male dominated and everything other industries maybe not so much but um what I found and I definitely aligned with this is um the way that women behave at work doesn't always benefit them so when you think about when we apply for a job right there's been loads of studies on this when mm, we apply for yes. a job we look at a job description and women need to be able to basically tick everything on that job description to apply to it whereas a man will look at it and get to about 50 percent and say oh okay i can do some of those I'll things it, i'm still I'll gonna apply it. for it yes and you know what happens they get the job yes yes right yes they get it yes. and um there was actually a book um that was written which was um don't quote me on this but it, I think the title was what got you here won't get you, well, there. Get you there yes yes so you know they talk about all of these um characteristics that people need to um see within themselves and address so that they can get their next promotion whatever it is but what they found is those characteristics were very much aligned with men it, it wasn't general and then there was another book that came out, which is all to do with female characteristics. So it's very much aimed at the female mind and how we act. And th I think there's 13 characteristics there. And all of them, I'm sure we can all attest to at some point in our careers. And some of them mention things like not um, promoting yourself enough. So not actually putting your hand up and saying, I did that. Yeah. Females have a problem with saying, I did that instead of my team did that. Or just like I mentioned, we the, did the, that, yeah. Instead it's, of I. we did it, you know, um, because we feel very shy. We feel like we're going to be showing off, um, yes. and it's not. It's not true, it's not you know. Showing it, off, it's not showing. It's off. not showing yeah. off. You, you have achieved. It's a fact. It, you, you have, have achieved, achieved this. That. You were, the, yeah, like, you were the lead, and it's your achievement as a leader. Exactly, exactly. Like, go and talk about it. Um, it doesn't mean that you're showing off. So I think, especially with younger females, I would say, or anyone really, but especially those who are, you know, breaking into the field or the industry, um, maybe a bit nervous to do this, just do it. Talk about your achievements, yes. you know, because that is how you're going to be seen and recognized. And that's how we're going to start to level up. Uh, we have to market ourselves. Yes, and the very first step to do that is, I'm also big in, in self-development, so the very first step to do that is to see that in you and to recognize yes. that that is your achievement. I like having a list of what I call the micro wins. It's like every, I journal once in a while, not every day, but it's like, hey, my micro win of the day. Oh yeah, oh, yesterday I went trekking and I had 20, I did 20K steps. I'm like, whoop, whoop. Yep. micro win in my exercise journey but what that's doing is it's training the mind to see all the achievements that you had day by yep. day day by day so you start seeing yourself as a person that achieved that rather than rather than not right exactly it like starts exactly. going into your consciousness such that then you can communicate it but first you have to acknowledge that and see exactly. yourself as a person that made it happen you're doing things right I, I'm a huge list person so with small things and big things I like to have a list and tick things off that I'm doing during the day and I physically write them I'm just someone who likes to physically tick something off because it makes me it's a win and it has been scientifically proven as well like if I'm I mean I'll have a list anyway but if I'm having a bit of a rubbish day and I'm like oh I don't feel like I've achieved something I'll get my pen and uh, paper out I'll make a list of even if it's mundane tasks, because the day to day, there's a lot of things that you do that you don't, you know, perhaps even realize, but they're really key to do. So I make a list of things that I've wanted to do and even things that I've already done. So I'll kind of retrospectively look back and say, oh, look, I did that. I can take it off. So it makes me feel like, you know what? I've actually done something. So yeah, you're absolutely right. You have to see within yourself what your worth is and just go for it. Like absolutely go yes. for it. I love it. That's a beautiful way to finish the episode. It's been a pleasure having you in the show. Where can we find you and your podcast? 
So, I, first of all, it has been an absolute pleasure being on. Thank you so much for having me, Mummy. Thank you. Um, I'm on LinkedIn, um, and I also have a podcast of my own called A Girl in the Product World. So check it out. Exactly, exactly. And of course, I'll put the links uh, in the in the podcast comments. Everyone, it's been an absolute pleasure. Do reach out to Amna and myself. We both do mentoring. So if you are listening, reach out. Okie dokie, everyone. See you next week. Ciao, ciao. Hello again. It's been an absolute pleasure. I learned tons from this conversation and hopefully you gained some insights, knowledge, or inspiration. It could mean the world if you follow, share, and rate the show because it gives me feedback. And remember, if you have fintech, product, career, or life direction questions, reach out. I'm always happy to help. Go to my LinkedIn page, Monica Millares, and send me a connection request. DM me and book time for a free mentoring session. See you next week. Ciao, ciao.